Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's Special Edition. My name is Camel, and today we are going to delve into the random facts, hidden secrets, and obscure particulars of the game and run through 10 things that you didn't need to know about Skyrim, but secretly you totally need to know them. Timestamps for each can be found down in the description, along with links to my social media and to my other Skyrim Special Edition videos. Be sure to check all of that out, and please consider sponsoring the channel. And if you do know of any interesting trivia, facts, or secrets about Skyrim, be sure to let me know about them down in the comments, and I'll cover them in the next video. So firstly, let's take a closer look at the steel plate armor. A set I'm sure we all know, and a set I'm sure most of us would agree looks pretty damn epic. But did you ever just stare at this steel plate armor and think, something isn't quite right. If so, you've got good reason to feel that way, as on the helmet and on the circles on the sides of the armor, we can actually find Daedric runes. So two things here. Firstly, why are there Daedric runes on steel plate armor? Surely something having Daedric runes would mean it is associated with the Daedra or a Daedric cult or something of the sort. I honestly don't think that there is a law reason for this. It's more likely someone who designed the steel plate armor, you know, thought it looked cool and put Daedric runes on it. And secondly, what do these Daedric runes say? <clears throat> Excuse my uh, poor Daedric. Net ot rod dot peyam lir eam teyam ekam, which translates to Nord Plate. So in Daedric Ruins on Steel Plate Armor, it says Nord Plate. Why Nord Plate? Why not Steel Plate? Well, there is actually a pretty good explanation for this, as in the concept art for Skyrim, we can find the concept art for the steel plate armor. But we'll notice that it's actually labeled as the Nord Plate Armor. So it was designed as Nord Plate Armor. So they put that text on the armor itself. That's why the Daedric runes say Nord Plate and not Steel Plate. Then later on, it was changed to Steel Plate Armor, but they had already designed the model and it went into the game as Steel Plate Armor with the Daedric text saying Nord Plate. So that's pretty cool and I love trivia like this. So be sure to let me know if you have any other cool facts like this about Skyrim. Now, while we're on the subject of armor, let's have a little chat about the Mask of Clavicus Vile, the Daedric Artifact. It's a reward for completing the Daedric Prince Clavicus Vile's quest. It's also been in several of the previous Elder Scrolls games, including the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, in which it improved your reputation, the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, in which it fortified your personality, the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, in which it also fortified your personality, and finally in Skyrim, in which it makes prices better, fortifies your speech skill, and increases magicka regeneration. Across all of the games in one way or another, it's basically had the effect of making people in-game like you more. So the general gist of the helmet is that it inspires people around you to enjoy your company as it charms the citizens of Tamriel with the magical enchantments of a Daedric Prince, Clavicus Vile. But did you know that in both model and concept, the mask of Clavicus Vile is based on the horned helmet of King Henry VIII. It was crafted for a young King Henry VIII by master armor craftsman Conrad Sulzenhofer. It was crafted in the year 1511 and was commissioned by the Holy Roman Emperor himself. King Henry VIII was known to wear this on occasion in public to inspire his people with his very charming helmet. Yeah, good work. All you'll be doing is inspiring them to run away. But as previously mentioned, the Mask of Clavicus Vile was physically based on this helmet and the concept of it inspiring people was also carried across into the Elder Scrolls universe. Now, if cool Easter eggs like this interest you, be sure to check out my full Skyrim Easter egg video in which we cover over 100 Easter eggs just like this. And if you ever really want to impress someone on a date, rock up with this helmet on. It works a treat for being arrested instantly. Ah yes, now do you ever wish you could move around underwater faster? Do you ever wish the Elder Scrolls themselves had more of a purpose? Well, for that one person out there who has thought those two things, I do have something for you. Now if we go underwater in Skyrim, we'll see that swimming around, it's not too slow, but it's not too fast either. Well, throughout the main questline and also during the Dawnguard main questline, we'll get our hands on some of the Elder Scrolls. So while underwater, if we go into our inventory and select one of the Elder Scrolls, we'll then read it. We'll get the flash, the glowing runes and all that jazz, but once the animation of reading the Elder Scrolls has finished, 
guess what? We will no longer be swimming, but instead running as if on land. So this way you can run and even sprint underwater, allowing you to traverse the seas and waters of Skyrim much faster. Now look, this isn't particularly useful. Well, I mean it is, but sadly there isn't really anything in the waters of Skyrim, especially when compared to Oblivion and Morrowinds, where you could find hidden ancient underwater dungeons and stuff like that. Skyrim just missed that element completely, making underwater exploration in Skyrim absolutely unrewarding. I mean, sure, there's a few shipwrecks, there's a chest or two, but again when compared to previous Elder Scrolls games, Skyrim's underwater exploration is beige. It's so boring. So what's the point of this if you're not really gonna explore underwater anyway? Well, I mean it's a cool little piece of trivia, it's good to know, and it could come in use if you want to run around the ocean to harvest Nordic barnacles, clams, salmon, things like that, but apart from this you'll probably not find much use for it. But be sure to let me know if you can come up with any cool ideas and ways to use this me mm, I was going to call it a mechanic, but it's, it's probably a bug. But nonetheless, it's in the game, so use it. Oh, and if you do wish to learn more about the Elder Scrolls themselves, the actual scrolls within the games and their lore, I do have a full lore video covering in depth the lore surrounding the Elder Scrolls themselves, the actual scrolls within the games. It's pretty interesting and gets pretty metaphysical, so be sure to check that one out. So I was wandering around the other day, and went into the Giant's Grove. You'll come here during Malakath's stage request. Anyway, I was having a poke around and found out I wasn't the only one getting poked around here. So there is a giant here, and there's lots of mammoth cheese. Got me thinking, maybe giants just eat cheese. Maybe giants are connected to Sheogorath. Or maybe that's a crazy idea. But hey, if giants just eat cheese, they're not that bad, really. Then I found something I've never seen before in Skyrim, something that made me slightly uneasy. Next to the fire, there is a delicious meal being spit roasted. A charred, cooked and smoldering corpse, stuck like a pig and slid onto a giant wooden spike, to be rotisserie roasted in this giant's bonfire. A nice meal for the giant. It's kind of cool and interesting to find, and it's also absolutely horrific and makes giants much scarier. As far as I am aware, this is the only giant's camp in the game where we can find a human being cooked to be eaten by the giant. And as always, please feel free to correct me if you have found this somewhere else in the game, more specifically at a giant's camp. But I was not prepared to find this. Although my interests were ignited, just like this guy. I was also deeply disturbed, just like this guy's intestines were deeply disturbed by a giant impaling spike up the ah. Ah yes, now next up we have something that you may have noticed. During the beginnings of the main quests for Skyrim, we'll be sent to a dungeon called Ustengrav, something like that. And despite finishing the quest and clearing the dungeon out, Ustengrav will never acquire the cleared tag. If you are unaware of this, once you finish a dungeon and clear it out, completing whatever quest was in there, looting the end chest, things like that, when you go back to your map, there will be a cleared tag on it, letting you know that you've finished your business there, you've completed that dungeon. And if you were thinking of going there, it's just like a, hey, you've already been there, you've done that, you don't need to go here. Well, for no good reason, Ustengrav will never be considered as cleared by the game. Luckily, this has no effect on the gameplay or achievements or anything like that, but because it's never tagged as cleared, it means enemies within will never respawn, and also the items in containers and also lying around within the dungeon will never reset. So every storage container and thing like that in here is considered as safe storage. And safe storage is a place within the game where you can place your items and know that they will never vanish after a certain amount of time in game. Although why do you want to store items in here? I don't know. But uh, let's get out of here, this place is too hazy. It's just so unclear. A ball. Now we'll be heading to the rift, as there is a location known as Froki's Shack. There is a whole quest you can get here, blah 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 blah, but that's not what we're doing here. Just to the north of his house, down the hill, there is an Orichalcum ore vein. You might notice that sticking out of the side of it, there is a pickaxe. Yeah, that's pretty cool, and tells the story of someone coming down here and mining the ore. I do love things like this, where you know that some developer decided to do this and put this pickaxe here and gives you a sense of love that went into the game. But there is something else down here that you may or may not have noticed yet. Sitting on top of the ore vein, we can find one 
diamond. Now, while mining ore veins in Skyrim occasionally, along with the relevant ore, you'll also have a small chance of getting gemstones from mining the ore veins. Well, this isn't that. It's not in the ore. I didn't have to mine it to reveal the diamond. It's just sitting on top which means that someone mined this diamond out, then decided to just leave it sitting here. At the very least, they could have made a carrot cake with it. Strange that someone would abandon this here, although going back to the pickaxe, I do love weird things like this, where you know someone at Bethesda Game Studios decided to do this for the 0.1% to find. So if you ever need a diamond, you know where to get one easily. Also, if you love curious finds like this, be sure to check out my Curating Curious Curiosities video for the Rift, in which we have a look at the many strange things that can be found within the hold of the rift. Be sure to check that out, I'm sure you'll love it. Now, we'll be going into space? Well, not quite into space, but we'll be looking up at space. So in the Elder Scrolls, there are two moons. Massa, also known as Jode or Mara's Tear, and Secunda, also known as Joan or Shandar's Sorrow. Did you ever just look at them and think, you look familiar? Well, if you did, there is a reason why. Firstly, let's take a look at Massa, the larger moon. So this is what it looks like. And here is what Mars looks like. Oh, would you look at that, Massa is Mars. Well, that explains why you may have thought that Massa looked familiar, because it is literally within our solar system. Now let's take a look at Secunda, the smaller of the two moons. And then let's take a look at Neptune's moon, Triton. Now we can see similarities, but we'll see here side by side that they don't link up the same way Massa and Mars did. I couldn't find any images of Secunda or Triton that matched up. I mean, sure, we can see similarities maybe, but I'm not sold. Now, the reason I compared Secunda to Triton is because it's been accepted that Secunda is based off of Triton. Although again, I really can't see or find any solid evidence of that. Now, if you do recognize which planet or moon Secunda is based off, be sure to let me know down in the comments. But Secunda, is the moon that becomes the blood moon in the Elder Scrolls. And here is a picture of Secunda as the blood moon. And here is a picture of our moon here on Earth. Well, 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 would you look at that? Secunda as the blood moon is an image of our moon with some kind of red filter over it. Now, if you've played the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind's Blood Moon expansion or the Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim's Dawnguard expansion, you will have seen Secunda as the Blood Moon, as Secunda is the moon that becomes the Blood Moon. And with that in mind, there's one other thing I'd like to add to this whole Blood Moon thing. When we walk into Bloated Man's Grotto during her scene's Daedric quest, Ill Met by Moonlight, we'll see a giant red moon with a blood red sky. Oh my God, it's the famed professorial blood moon. And when we walk in, we'll also have this said to us. Has the blood moon called you, fellow hunter? It's confirmed, this is the blood moon. Well, guess what? This isn't actually a blood moon, as this moon we can see is Massa and not Secunda. Again, Secunda is the one that turns into the Blood Moon. Massa does not turn into the Blood Moon. So again, this isn't actually a Blood Moon, just a super red sky with a big red moon, but it's the wrong moon. If we turn around 180 degrees, we can actually find Secunda, which is almost entirely shrouded in darkness. And again, it's not in its Blood Moon phase. And while Massa looks very Blood Moony, Secunda is the only one that matters and the one that is not Blood Red. So no, this isn't actually a blood moon we experience here in Bloated Man's Grotto. It's just a very red sky. I'm assuming this was meant to be a blood moon, as I mean, even the NPC says it's a blood moon that called him here. And you know, we've got the blood red sky with a big moon. It's just the wrong bloody moon. So that's something that uh, irked me slightly. And moving on from the moons, next I will be taking a closer look. No one's gonna guess what I'm gonna say here. We'll be taking a closer look at Bats. Yes, bats. Not something you really encounter often in Skyrim. In fact, there are only five times in the game you'll run into bats. Now, this isn't including anything to do with the vampire powers in Dawnguard, but of course, we're talking about normal alive bats. Bats you find in caves, natural bats living out in the wilderness. Now, when you do run into bats within Skyrim, they fly past you in a second. You never really get to see them. But after pausing the game time, we can take a closer look at them. 
and they really are fully fleshed out bats. Now the places you can run into these tiny little mammals is the exit of Dim Hollow Crypt, the final chamber of Bleak Falls Barrow, before entering Pine Peak Cavern, the tower above Blind Cliff Cave, and inside Bloated Man's Grotto, during the aforementioned quest ill met by Moonlight with the fake Blood Moon. But the point of all this is, I find it really crazy that someone or some poor group of people had to design the bats, model them, texture them, create custom animations for them and noises for them so that they could be used five times in all of Skyrim? Even if you encounter all five colonies of bats, you will have seen bats in game for a total of around 10 seconds in your whole playthrough of Skyrim? That's insane to me, but is also one of the things that makes these games so great. Tiny details like this. And as much as we like to bash Bethesda for the mistakes they make, and they do make mistakes like the Blood Moon, they do also put in incredible effort when it comes to the minutia of Skyrim and the games they design. For this next one, we'll be going back to the start of the game. While you're in the cart, being led to Helgen, this young chap is flapping his lips the whole way. We all know someone like that. Anyway, as we approach the town, he says this. This is Helgen. I used to be sweet on a girl from here. Wonder if Elod is still making that mead with juniper berries mixed in. Mead with juniper berries. Sounds like it could be tasty, I guess. But juniper berries are actually poisonous in, you know, substantial quantities, but they are used for flavorings in real life, so I suppose mead with juniper berries could work, but I guess we'll just never find out as Helgen was destroyed. Oh wait, what's that? We can find out. Well, if we head back to Helgen after the initial battle and the devastation of Alduin, we can make our way up this tower and jump out the hole in the side and land on the second floor of the once Tavern of Helgen. Laying scattered on the ground, we can actually find mead with juniper berries, just as Ralph said in the cart. This is the only place in the game that these can be found, and an awesome little detail added into Skyrim for anyone willing to venture back here to Helgen. Now the mead with juniper berries, while everyone's like, yeah, it's probably identical, it's actually got different effects to the standard Nord mead that can be found in Skyrim, as it restores 20 points of stamina, where, as the standard Nord mead only restores 15 points of stamina. Its reduction of Stamina regeneration also has a duration of 40 seconds, whereas the stamina regeneration reduction applied by standard Nord Mead only lasts for 30 seconds. So, mead with juniper berries is actually better in some ways and worse in other ways when compared to the standard Nord Mead. Anyway, something that not many people know about this is it's the favorite drink of anti-Semitic lobsters. Why? Prepare yourself for this one. Because it contains Jew. Nipper. Ew, that's, uh, that one actually hurt. And finally, we have something rather cool and will leave you with a buzz. Or, you know, it might leave you with butterflies in your stomach, something like that. Why? Well, as we discovered in the last episode of 10 Things You Didn't Need to Know About Skyrim, you can jump on the back of birds and fly around on them. If you haven't already, check that video out. Well, we can also do this with insects, although I could only get this to work with butterflies and moths. So firstly, if you have the unofficial patch, this doesn't work. So if you do want to try this out, you'll have to uninstall the Skyrim unofficial patch. Secondly, we'll need to find some butterflies or moths. Wait until they get near the ground, then jump up onto them. I found that when you go into sneak mode, your character's foot clipping box increases greatly, increasing your chances of staying on the butterfly as it takes off. And sure enough, after minutes of effort, you get a free ride all the way to five feet away. Wow, it's not quite as dramatic as surfing on a bird like we saw last time, but it is something that is rather cool and ironically, something that was recognized as a bug and removed with the unofficial patch. Now this works because butterfly and moth wings have clip and hit boxes so that you can hit them out of the sky but it also means that you can jump onto them and they have a solid clip box that you can stand on. Again, I tried to do this with bees and torch bugs as well, but I couldn't manage to pull it off or pull it on to their backs. But be sure to let me know if you can manage to jump on a bee or jump on a torch bug. And be sure to let me know if you can think of any cool ways to use this to your advantage in the game. And with that, we have 10 things that you didn't need to know about Skyrim, but secretly totally need to know. And 
And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I've been Camel. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something new about the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of the crazy things that can be found within it. You will be very interested in checking out my other Skyrim Special Edition videos that I've already done. Links to them can be found down in the description. Now down there in the old description, you can also find links to my social media. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you would like to support the channel in a more personal way, you can become a sponsor right here on YouTube and sponsor the channel. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most appreciated and welcome in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.